get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and we are going to be talking about, uh, well, something a little different tonight. I'm going to be taking questions from a member of our audience, kind of about the basics of libertarianism and some questions that she has. So I'll be talking to Miranda right after this. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle, and as I said, it's a little bit different this week. Uh, I have I did this with Lex a while back. I forget what the topic was, but my friend Lex had some questions about something that was going on in the news, and uh, she's like, you know, I really want to understand this thing, and I don't quite know a lot about it. Uh, can you explain this to me? And I said, you know what? Not for nothing, but... I don't want to explain this for one person on Facebook Messenger. Why don't you come on the show and we'll talk about it. And I've wanted to do a little bit more of this and I'd like to do more of it. So if you listen to this show and you're like, I'd love to come on and ask a bunch of questions of you, then please send me a note at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Uh, a while back in our Facebook group, which you can join at wearelibertarians.com, uh, one of the members posted a long list of questions of quite a few different things. And uh, I said, hey, would you like to come on? And so she's here now. Miranda, thank you for joining us. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And uh, I forget, what were some of the things that you were asking in the group? Uh, you, you, it, everybody, our group is so polite. Our group, our, like Trisha Stewart is like, the time I came on We Are Libertarians, everyone after that, that came from Wall was so nice, so polite. I, as a woman, I'm treated well, and so thank you to the We Are Libertarians audience for not being full of creepertarians and abusive a-holes. Um, and so I love the interaction that we have in our group, but everybody always starts out their posts like, please, and, and this must be because all the other groups, like the Lions Pride uh, or the Lion Liberty, Lions of Liberty Forum, for instance, um, must just be vicious. Uh, everybody goes, please don't attack me. I have a question because I'm new. <laughs> oh my gosh it's like 50 percent of the time it always starts out that way what yeah. what were you asking that first time that you posted well the first time i posted i was really just kind of looking for um sources to you know read more about the philosophy behind libertarianism and i actually got a lot of feedback on that so that that was really nice one of us, one of us. I'm sure you got more than you bargained for. What were some of the helpful yeah. things you found in that? I got, I got a lot. Um, well, I got some book sources, and I've really only started reading one. I started reading just Ayn Rand's nonfiction book, um, Atlas Shrugged. That's really the only one I've had time to start. I can't start five different things. I have to start off at one place and then kind of work my way through, but... Mm. Well, you picked one that's going to take you 17 years. How far have you made it into Atlas Shrugged? I'm already at like 250 pages. That's good. That's way further but, than you made it. That's what? That's way further than I made it. I made it in like 50 pages. I was like, I'm done with this. Oh, man. I actually find it. I, I don't know. I, kind of, I really like it so far. It just gives uh -oh. me a different perspective. Like, it's a point of view that I've never really looked at and that I've never really heard from. So it's in, in what way? Like capitalism, basically it's, it's from what I get from it. It's basically from the point of view of, you know, true capitalists and uh, you know, why should people damn me for just trying to work, make the world great, you know? Right. So that's pretty much just what I've gotten from it so far. But well, Very good. Yeah, I haven't read the books. I did watch the atrocious movies. The first one's not bad. And you can get kind of some of the principles from it. 
But I, I think that's a, where a lot of people start with Atlas Shrugged, and that kind of leads them into harder drugs like Murray Rothbard. So that's always a good, good place to start. Um, so how did you find out about We Are Libertarians? How did you find out about our group? I assume you might listen to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, it's kind of a long story. I, I didn't really know much about libertarianism before. I had looked into it in the past when Gary Johnson was, you know, big in the media. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, at the time, some of it just seemed, you know, pretty radical to me, like, uh, I don't know, it just seemed a little bit too radical for me at the time. And then I just never really looked into it. And then like last year, toward the end of last year, there were a few things that just made me kind of just fed up with Republicans and Democrats. And I just felt like I couldn't agree with either of them. And I was really looking for something else. So I looked back into libertarianism and I first went to their, you know, first led me to their page and and I, the party page, and I read their, you know, creed and all that. And I'm thinking, wow, like, this is almost exactly me. Like, why have I not, why have I not been attached to this yet? And so I literally just look, I searched in my podcast, Libertarians, and this was the first one that came on. So cool. I started listening to it. And I was like, this is awesome. I love these people. Like, so, yeah, I've just, I've been listening ever since. And No, 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 go on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that's great. Yeah, that's, and you have a story that is very similar to a lot of people. And this is what I've tried to tell a lot of the older, more seasoned libertarians who've been around a long time like me. Like, don't beat up so much on Gary Johnson because there's a lot of Mirandas out there who are going, why did libertarians hate Gary Johnson? They all just seem nuts. I don't get any of this. I mean, did you see... Uh, what were some of the things that you saw as radical or what, what kind of turned you off? Do you have any recollection? Oh man, this is a few years ago, but, um, okay. So just the fact that the, I'm not sure if it was Gary Johnson specifically, or if it was just libertarians that I saw that they just kind of just wanted, it seemed like they just wanted to get rid of like all government and like all taxation. And at the time I just, I wasn't, I wasn't in that mindset. And right. I have been kind of like an environmental person for like ever. And I don't know, I couldn't give up the thought of getting rid of like environmental law. Like it just, it wasn't in my head. I, so I don't know, it just seemed kind of radical to me to like have the idea to kick government out of it and like let everybody do their own thing. But I mean, like within the last year, I'm just, I'm hearing different perspectives and I'm seeing the other side of it now. So it appeals to me a lot more than it did then, just because I feel okay. like I'm a bit more open-minded to it. And the fact that I have so much disdain for everything else, I'm just kind of ready to give it up. I think you're in the place that a lot of us are at the beginning where it's like, I know my eyes aren't deceiving me. I know this isn't working. There's clearly something about this that is not working. And I'm not quite sure what it is, but I need to find a different answer. And I think that, uh, that draws a lot of people to libertarianism because it's a different answer. Uh, and that's one of the things that we tried to do here is try to help you make sense of what's going on in the world. Um, now, before we jump in, because I essentially what I want to do is have conversations like this with people who are newer to libertarianism and like, I don't get this. I mean, I've been following the libertarian world for about a decade now, and I still every single day learn something new. And in the beginning, I kind of had this concept of if I just believe with 95% of these issues that I'm a libertarian, and that is true, but then once you learn more about the philosophy, you start to see the all-encompassing nature, but it takes a long time to work through that. So that's what I want to do with Miranda tonight is kind of work through some of those issues and think about things in a more philosophical way, maybe uh, just kind of answer some of her questions and some of her stumbling blocks. But first, let's kind of get an idea of where you're at politically. Uh, you told us a little bit, but or would you say you identified with a party? Where whereabouts do you live? How old are you? Like, what's your party makeup? Like, 
What's kind of your political experience? Just give us just like a quick overview of who is Miranda? Well, um, I'm 24 years old and I am from, I'm originally from Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, kind of, I grew up in St. Louis, but I went to high school in a really small town at, south of St. Louis. But I honestly was never into politics. Um, growing up, my family, I had a pretty big family, a lot of aunts and uncles. No one ever dis discussed politics that I heard, but they were all um, very independent. And I know that, you know, most of them, you know, didn't like welfare and, and, and things of that nature, like government stuff. Um, I knew that, but they never talked about politics or anything. Um, and I really didn't even start watching, you know, paying attention to the news until high school. And I didn't even vote until I was in college. So mm -hmm. this is all, I mean, it's, it's pretty new to me. I mean, it's, it's been a few years, probably since like 2014, 2015, since I've really started paying attention to what's going on. Um, but I never identified as a Democrat or Republican, really, because I'm not for the drug war. I've never been for the drug war. I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's so stupid to lock people up for something that everybody does. Like, mm -hmm. almost everybody does it. It doesn't make them a bad person. So why would you... you like, are you a pothead fucker? Huh? Just, are you a pothead? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm hearing. I'm just kidding, Miranda. Don't answer that. <laughs> You're young. You have a bright future ahead of you. Don't run your life like I have. Um, I yeah, mean, the, drug war, yeah, the drug war, you look at it and you go, if you want to smoke the, the block of a Chevy, the, the engine block of a Chevy, go for it. Like you're, if you're stupid enough to, to, to do hard drugs or in my case, I don't do anything. Like I, that's our choice. Like if you want yeah. to do drugs and if you want to not do drugs, like it's really your choice. You're not really affecting other people. And then when you look yeah. at, and then people always come back with that tangential, well, what if you got in a car and drive and hit somebody? And then you go, well, what about the entire South and Central American countries we've destroyed <laughs> because yeah, of the drug exactly. war? So. Exactly. Yeah. And like, oh my God, I forgot where I was going to go. What's your cat's name, by the way? Oh, this is Phil. Phil? Okay, I heard Phil meowing yeah. in the background. And uh, Phil is a beautiful uh, white and tan. Is that called calico? I just call him an alley cat. I don't know, okay. what, <laughs> I don't know what the coat color is called. No, he's uh, just a... Or is it... I thought it was a tabby. Yeah, that's, that, yeah. that's about what that is. All right. Well, I have ADD, as you can tell. So I get distracted yeah. very easily yeah, and I cannot walk by. And when I see a cat, I have to say hi to it. Yeah, I know you have a cat, too. I've heard you talk about your cat walking. Yep. Mitten, and Mitten's right literally up. started walking up right now. She's coming to say hi. Muffins was here earlier. So, so let's, <laughs> let's jump in. Let's start with some of your questions. I know that you okay. are very – I hope every person that does this is as diligent as you are. You, you, like, messaged me with a list of dates and questions, and I was like, this is great. I wish any of my co-hosts were as organized as Miranda is. So let's start off with like kind of the first thing that is, you're running into that you want to know about. Well, I mean, should, I mean, I guess, should we start with the political stuff? Yeah, let's start with politics. So I'm curious why, okay, why is there such a huge two-party system? Like, and why, why is it so hard for libertarians to win to get up to win the presidency? I mean, they run, but mm -hmm. they only get like what a, a single digit percent of the vote or something every yeah. time. And it, it was I mean, one one percent of the vote normally, and then Gary Johnson got three percent of the vote. I mean, does it have to do with like ballot access and and yes. and money, basically? Mm hmm. Yep. Exactly right. And. It, it, going back to our founding, the, have you heard of the term gerrymandering? Uh, yeah, where they draw certain political lines and they can do it to like favor. Right, favor and that is named after right. That's named after Elbridge Gerry, who signed. I th I know he signed the Constitution or the Declaration. Uh, he was really good friends with John Adams and Elbridge Gerry. In the first in Massachusetts, started drawing lines that were favorable to his party, and a local newspaper called it gerrymandering and so now it's it's turned into gerrymandering so it's named after one of the founders it's 
from the very birth of our republic, the politicians in this country have been drawing lines that are favorable to their particular interests. And as democracy has grown, the citizens of this country have been able to kind of pull and push a little bit more to get, uh, to get fair lines. But I think we're at a point now where it is, it's insane that we don't have artificial intelligence drawing the lines. I was involved in a project called Rethinking Redistricting in 2009 here in Indiana, and it was put forward by then Secretary of State, future Congressman, now out of Congress, named Todd Rakita. And he worked with the Brennan Center to draw lines based on artificial intelligence, completely separate from political interest, just apportioned by population. Okay. And what you saw were the districts drawn by Republicans in, 2000, in 1999, 2000, had neighborhoods cut in half and city streets were cut in half. Well, if you lived on one side, you're in the fifth congressional district and on the other side, you were in the seventh. And when you redrew the lines, you kept all these communities together, you kept neighborhoods together, you kept, and it ended up, you know, we had, um, I think that next year, six competitive state Senate and state house races out of 150, six were competitive. And under the new maps, it would have been like 50. And oh. so, you're right. And so what the, what the parties do is they draw lines to preserve resources, basically. So they're going to fight it out in those six instead of 50. And it's, a way, oh. it is, and it's a way to basically centralize control because then the parties, the caucuses within the state houses – the politicians that kind of make up the, the esh top echelons can then determine who's doling out the money to, to people in trouble or not. So it all comes down to keeping certainty within the political system. And that means that you and I are kind of out, out of the bounds. So you had, you had a question kind of clarifying some of that. Yeah, I'm just, um, so, so when they're, you know, drawing these lines, are, are they basing it off of like historical voting patterns like or like they how say exactly it is. are they choosing so in wisconsin that which is there's been a lot of lawsuits over wisconsin north carolina and several states there's been uh, the supreme court just punted on one of these i think in north carolina which is a huge mistake uh in wisconsin the state house republicans you, the, the way that the maps had always been drawn is it had been done on a committee and it had been kind of open and there was public comment and there was some level of transparency. But uh, when they drew the lines a decade ago, when Scott Walker was the governor, they literally would, the, the only transparency that they had, the, the people responsible for drawing the lines, two or three state house reps drew the maps and then would invite Republican state house members to come in and see where their map was drawn. Not the whole map, just their map. And none of the Democrats got to see it. And then they rushed it through and passed it. And so there were lawsuits uh, in all through the Wisconsin and federal courts around those maps and, and in several other states. And so there is a big push and it's spearheaded by the Brennan Center, which is out of, I think, um, a New York city college i think cuny um to to make to really push for fair maps and give a lot of data so if you're if you're if you want to go way down the rabbit hole on redistricting the brennan center is a great place to start okay and, and uh as is 538 did a podcast series on redistricting that was really good that kind of talked about a lot of this stuff but when you, when you ask, like, what criteria do they use? Yes, they use the criteria of past voting records, census data, uh, and, and any information they can get their hands on, and then they draw it in a way that is favorable to their party. And Democrats are beside themselves because there are more state Republican legislatures than there are Democrat legislatures. But the fact is, is that they do the same thing and have. That's why Democrats had control of the Congress for 40 years before the 1994 re revolution when Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House. So th both parties have basically hijacked this whole process. And that does play into 
why a lot of libertarian and third parties in general have a lot of problems because when you when you're drawing districts that are favorable to your party you then tend to move your your parties to the fringe and so that's why we've seen the parties move over the last 30 years more to the left and right and to to the point that the democrats are running some of the most radical democrats in 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 a hundred years for president because they can because their their farm team is basically made up of people that have safe seats and so the way that american politics works is just like barack obama you'll remember maybe that he became a state senator and then he moved up to united states senator and then he moved up to president you know um mike pence ran for congress and then he became vice president you, you start small and then you work your way up over time uh to to get into some of this so it 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 pushes all of the politics, all of the state house bills, all of the federal, and as a result later, all the congressional bills further to the wings and further to protectionist policies because they're protection, protecting their interest. And they implement things like restrictive ballot access laws. Uh, Ohio actually achieved ballot access and then John Kasich and the Ohio legislature removed their ballot access by changing uh, certain requirements here in Indiana, for instance. Uh, the Secretary of State's race is how the Indiana Libertarian Party gains ballot access. They have to get 2% in the Secretary of State's race. It used to be 0.5%, but then a Libertarian candidate in the mind of a local sheriff cost him an election, and the Democrat won the race, and so he went to his buddy in the state legislature, and they raised the ballot access limit to 2%, and for 20 years kicked the Libertarian Party off in, Indi in Indiana. Uh, and then there's, there's also um, the, the debate commission, for instance, is wholly, a wholly owned subsidiary, subsidiary of the Republican and Democratic Party. And so when Gary Johnson says, well, okay, what polls do I need to get to get 15% to get in the televised debate? They go, well, uh, this poll, this poll, this poll. And then the pollsters who have connections to the party only poll older people and people over 40 don't vote for the Libertarian Party candidate. It's like 1% of the vote comes from older people and then people under 40 vote at 10% according to a lot of exit polls. So there's a lot of systemic problems and then you add on top of that, if you're the Libertarian Party candidate, you have 50 different sets of ballot access rules. Uh, you have petitions, or, you know, here in Indiana, we have automatic ballot access. In some states, you have to go out and hire petitioners, and you have to get three times the amount of required signatures. It's a tremendous amount of work to get on the ballot, and it's almost impossible to get on the ballot in all 50 states if you're a third-party candidate. If you're running third-party, you had to start this year, early this year, to get on the ballot in November of next year. And so, systemically, the parties have really done a great job of protecting their interests, which doesn't always align with our interests. And you end up in a moment where if polled, the American people generally are very libertarian, but their elected representatives don't reflect that because the laws have been manipulated in their favor. So that was a lot, um, but that's kind of uh, why the libertarian party really has a tough time. And so it's really disingenuous when you see you know, people go, oh, well, they only get 1%. It's like, yeah, but you guys are cheating. It's like letting Coke and Pepsi design the, the rules for selling soda drinks. And then you wonder, why is RC Cola nowhere? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just insane to me. And how, how, how it's just allowed to go on like that really just blows my mind. Like, I, I just don't understand. It, so, it's it's so not let's completely free. You know, it's, it's not open at all. There's no fair, there's no fairness whatsoever. It's just, it's all, it's all fake and rigged like that. Right. So that's crazy. Po like, powerful, powerful corporate interests understand at this point in the game, predictability in the American political system is necessary. And it's because so much regulation, so much taxation, and so much, uh, you know, now tariff policy, uh, the, the government and corporations are so intertwined at this point in America 
then we have something called crony capitalism, which is not capitalism or free markets at all. It is um, an early stage of fascism. And corporate interests will maneuver uh, politics using money to ensure that a third party doesn't really get ahead because they want predictability. A third party candidate, that's why Trump is so hated by people in the corporate media, in the upper echelons of both party, in the, in the, uh, the class of pundits and intellectuals and college professors, and the, really the ruling elite in America hate Donald Trump because he's so unpredictable. We, we don't mind George Bush or Barack Obama because they're sort of the same as has always been. And so what I've always said to libertarians is like, watch what happens to Trump, because if you ever did actually get close to the White House, you would be treated in the exact same way. Your character would be assassinated. It'd be character assassination left and right. You're going to see it with Justin Amash. You're going to see a fine, upstanding human being completely propagandized into a demonic figure by the United States media because their bills are paid by the people that have also bought off the politicians. So the only way to really fight through the system is to share content like this, wake up enough people, and try to get enough people to understand what they're up against, what's going on, because you're disgusted right now. You're, you're mad. How, how can they get away with this? Who is in charge? Well, you're in charge. And so it's up to the listeners uh, to say to their friends, if you don't like what's going on, you've got to start learning what's going on and then start organizing against it. Hmm. I would, I would think that I, I just would think that, you know, big businesses would want a libertarian up there, you know, because they're about letting you be free. Right. But apparently not. That's, that's yes. Cool. Yes. But if you're Boeing or Northrop Grumman or any of the other weapons makers, Oh yeah. Uh, you don't want a libertarian up there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You don't, want, you don't want an independent thinker. You want somebody that you can control. George Bush looks like somebody you can control. <laughs> you know, George W. Bush is an affable guy, but seems like somebody that's probably controllable. Barack Obama just wanted power. He wanted to be a part of the club. And that's what a lot of these guys, well, that's what Donald Trump wants. Donald Trump wants to be accepted, and he's not, and so it drives him crazy, so he trolls him, which is great for us. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've heard you mention before, it, it's better to, you know, try to get libertarians locally and that will just, that will, you know, help them in the future, maybe move up. Yeah. So we have to build a farm team and I'm an advocate for people realizing that they can control what they can control. Um, I have a small circle of influence as do you which really is about the 100 people that we kind of come into contact with. And that's really where you want to make a lot of the regulations, rules, laws, decisions. That, that's kind of the sweet spot, that, that those few hundreds or thousands of people that you can kind of come into contact with. Major races for third parties are marketing opportunities. You're not going to win presidency or gubernatorial races or Senate races in the Libertarian Party. Your job is a marketer. And I've always told people to go look at the life of Eugene Debs, who ran for president four times in the early 1900s on the socialist ticket. If you go and read what Eugene Debs was advocating for in the party platform in 1908 or 1912, you go, holy crap, all that stuff happened. <laughs> And a hundred years after Eugene Debs, all the stuff that he ran uh, for ended up being implemented, including removing, uh, in, you know, the state legislatures used to pick who was your senator. You didn't vote on that. It was the states that picked the senator. And because of Eugene Debs and the Socialist Party, you now can vote for senator. And so... The top of ticket races, Eugene Debs was an amazing speaker. He would go and travel. He'd gather hundreds of people around and speak without a microphone and rally people to his cause. And he was so effective at turning people against World War I that Woodrow Wilson put him in jail for it. And so I think the libertarians really have kind of been missing that figure 
somebody who is a really great top of ticket speaker who really unites a lot of people. Ron Paul's probably the closest that we have. And Ron Paul, no one has ever accused him of being an amazing speaker, but he's the best we've got. And I think there's going to come a time in the next 20 years where we're going to have a really effective candidate that unites all the clans of libertarianism that kind of galvanizes the movement for the ideas of liberty. Mm -hmm. But until that person comes, th that person is never going to have that ability to do that without practice. Mm -hmm. And where is, where is his best chance to practice? It is at a township board race, and then a county council race, and then a state house race, and then a gubernatorial race, and then the presidency. And so it is important for people to start with lower offices to gain experience in running races because you'll be a better candidate. You'll actually talk to people and invest in your community. They'll get to see you. It's sort of... Um, a lot of ideas of that libertarians espouse seem seem really crazy, right? But if they meet a libertarian and they seem somewhat sane, then mm -hmm. they'll go, maybe some of these other ideas that they've got isn't so bad. And so let's look into it. And so what you what you get on the local level when you run for office is the chance to stand next to the person that will get elected. Maybe you'll get elected, but if you don't, you're standing in a forum or a debate or something put on the, by the League of Women Voters espousing ideas that you think are important and your opponents who, may, who are probably going to get elected hear you talking about those things. And so Rupert Bonham, when he ran for governor in 2012, talked a lot about reforming Indiana schools to uh, encourage more vocational training because the school systems here really push people to college. And he mm. said, the people, the people that I work with in lower class, the economic classes aren't going to college, so stop pushing that. Mm -hmm. and they tested it on the Mike Pence campaign. He won, he ran commercials in the, elect, in the election uh, touting our idea. He won, and then he implemented Rupert's idea. And so that's an example of how third parties can be really effective at the local level because you're talking about ideas that they may not have thought of because they're so busy trying to gain their own power or they're stuck in their own group think that we come along and we say, have you thought about this? No, that's a great idea. And so that's why I'm a big advocate for the Libertarian Party at the local level because I think it, I've seen it really impact local policy. I've seen Libertarian Party people show up to county council meetings with video cameras and say, from now on, your county council meetings will be live streamed to YouTube. Well, those old boomer county councilors who have been there for 30 years have no idea that nobody, literally one view may take place, but they're so freaked out that they canceled the $100 million project that they were going to build to put the plaque with their name on it. So we can be really effective. And if libertarian parties in counties can stop 50 of those projects a year, well, that's... $500 million, you know, there's a, there's a true cumulative cost of getting involved and saving your county money, encouraging more freedom and opening up, uh, you know, like we have one listener who we did a daily with him where he just sat down and had lunch with uh, all the city councilors and said, why can't I have chickens in my backyard? And they said, I don't know. That's a good question. And so he has chickens in his backyard now because he actually took the time to go get involved and actually sit down and, and he, he was given six freedoms, six freedom chickens uh, a year. So uh, it, you can be effective at the local level. It's pretty hard for me to convince you that whoever runs for president is going to really impact your life in any way that's significant right. outside of marketing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I guess if, you know, even if, they're in the presidency, they're only going to be in there for so long. And right. if you don't change the hearts and minds of everyone just within that time frame, then it's just going to go back to the way it was when you leave. So right. yeah, that makes sense. Is there, was there anything in that that you kind of were like, eh, or did that, I mean, any questions on some of that? I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious how like I could personally get involved. I mean, going to like town meetings and whatnot. I mean, I just, I never hear of any of that. And 
around here, but I guess that's something I would have to probably research into and maybe call about. Yeah, you could, your town or city or what state are you in now? North Dakota. Okay. Yeah, Fargo. I guarantee if you're in a city the size of Fargo, they have a website and they'll post when the meetings are. And what you realize is that when you show up, you sit in the back of the room and then you start to see these same other crackpots that are there. And after like two or three times, you kind of see the same faces and then they start to recognize your face because I'm not going to lie. The second a 24 year old female walks into a city council meeting and sits down, everybody's going to be super curious as to what you're doing there. They're going to wonder if you're a reporter or if you're a staffer. And when you're neither of those, it short circuits their brain because the only, the only people that show up that are interested at, from the public are usually 65 year old white guys. And so young people showing up to these meetings really can, you, you can just by virtue of your age, uh, and gender, to be quite honest, um, you can get a lot of, uh, uh, you can get easy introductions because they want to try to get you to work on their campaign, which that may not be a bad thing. You may actually want to go work on a Republican or Democrats campaign, you know, and say, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't know that I believe what you believe, but I'll stuff some envelopes so I get the chance to talk to you a little bit more to figure out what you believe or, um, you'll find a lot of closet libertarians in elected office uh, that way. Just showing up repeatedly will get you an introduction to your fellow crackpots, that 65-year-old guy with the dirty hat who, you know, shows up and starts ranting about the New World Order, you know, and then the, then the less crazy guy who's around the same description going, yeah, that's Dave. Uh, Dave, and that, it's kind of fun to talk to some of these weirdos. And then you talk to the, the, the media, you talk to it, just going to the, to the city council meetings can be a great way to just kind of get an idea of what's really going on in your community. And you can find all of that at a website. And I would honestly say, do that before you go to a libertarian party meeting, like go to a libertarian party meeting to invite them to the city council meeting with you. So you don't go alone. If you're, if you're shy, I'm not shy about going to stuff like that alone. Um, some people are they would rather die than walk into a, a place where they're a stranger <laughs> but i would suggest going to your county council city council town council meetings before you go to a libertarian party meeting because i think you're you're going to get if you understand how government works you're going to be more effective at dismantling it Instead of just going to the Libertarian Party meeting and ranting about how we need to dismantle it and never learn a thing about how your government works. Yeah, that makes sense. Is that something that you would do? I mean, yeah. Like, I, I, I realize now how important it is, and I, I, feel like, I feel like I need to make up for all my years of not paying attention. Like, You're 24. Miranda, well, please. Okay. Well, to me, it, to me, it feels like that. It, feel, it feels like I just, I spent too much time not paying attention and now I have all this catch up. I have all this catch up to do and like. Right. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I do want to start doing that. I need to. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, it's usually, it's one Monday evening a month. You know, it's, it's. People say, oh, I'm too busy for that. That's bullshit. That's, excuse me, bull crap. I'm trying not to curse as much anymore. Um, you do have the time. You just don't want to make the time. Like, you want to be mad and want someone else to fix it, but that's not how this problem is going to get solved. We're all going to have to take some responsibility to fix it. Yes, that, that's, that's very true. That makes a lot of sense. So, all right. So, what, what other questions do you have? So... Okay, I'll just start with a really basic one then. Where does libertarianism come from? I mean, I know, you know, we wrote the Constitution on these, on these basic liberties, but I mean, were, were there people before that, you know, well before that? Has this, has this always been kind of an idea? Y yes um, and no. So... What, what most people don't realize is the idea of liberty and individual rights specifically are very new concepts in terms of human history. 
And so if you're not a young earth creationist and you believe that humans have existed for, let's say, 100 to 100,000 years, um, for most of human history, we have existed in small roving bands. And, you know, you and I, 100,000 years ago, if we were together in a tribe, there would be uh, 20 to 50 other men and women and there'd be a bunch of kids and nobody would know who the paternity of the kid, like, it, it just was, it was very much a pat, we were pat creatures and we were nomadic. And then sometime around, what, 6,000 BC, I think we started to build in Sumeria, Egypt, we started to build city states and, uh, or, or empires or larger than tribe type cities. And we started to elect rulers. Now, in those tribes, there were always people who were in charge. There was, there's always been somebody that is the decider. You know, somebody who, when you have a problem, is kind of the, the authority figure. And you're in your office. I don't know what you do for a living, but let's say you're in an office of 10 people. There's a boss, right? So, um, but in a band of 50 people, it's hard not to be fairly egalitarian and try to get opinions from various people. But once we started to consolidate into cities and started to elect rulers, you started to get more and more removed if you're on the bottom rung from the people who are making decisions. And taxation began and that, that took income away from people. And you get to, to the Roman Empire, which is kind of the, the precipice. I mean, maybe uh, medieval Europe as well where it's just these massive empires where one guy is God <laughs> way over in Rome, but you live in Britain and, and he, he gets to do with you whatever he wants. You're a subject. Most of, let's say the period of history where we have writings and have some cognizance of how humans existed, uh, there has been some form of a ruler. And once you, I don't know if there's a great TV show on Netflix called Versailles and Louis the 14th was kind of the pinnacle. The sun King was the pinnacle of European Royal power. And Louis literally spoke for God. And so when a guy says that he speaks for God on earth, then you pretty much have to do whatever he says because you don't want to disobey God. And so he taxed people insanely and, it, it really robbed, um, like Louis XIV, not only taxed his people nearly to death and almost starved them, towards the end of his life, he started persecuting people over religion. So you didn't have freedom of thought. So you have this existence for a lot of human history where you're constantly being surveilled. You're constantly being harassed by local authorities who are doing things in the name of the ruler. You're being taxed. Your wealth what little wealth you have is being taken. And if somebody else wants to do something to you, like put you to death for thinking or saying something out loud, they can do it because they're the king and you're not. And once we get to the Enlightenment, after the Reformation in the 1500s, there starts to be a lot of strain of thought coming out of the Middle Ages of maybe it's not supposed to be this way. And it starts to kind of fracture. And so once in the Reformation, religion starts to crack, government starts to crack and the government then was monarchism in the west and uh, have i lost you at all I'm, i hope this isn't no. okay um and so you start to get people like frederick bastiat in france pop up and say uh or john milton in england and uh the the scottish reformation took place and you had people like adam smith and you started to have it from 1500 to 1700 all of these different little disparate people challenging the power of ultimate authority, divinely inspired rule. And the printing press just kind of lit that on fire. And the ideas of liberty really started to spread. And you get to, to England where, you know, France has this bloody revolution after, after our revolution and they're kind of taken out of the game. Uh, I should go back. I should go back to the 1600s, seven, early 1700s. You had John Locke in England, Adam Smith in Scotland. Um, 
John Milton, who I mentioned, uh, talking about individual rights and the government derives its not, it derives its power from its people. It doesn't derive its power from just being in charge. Like you can't just d- walk into a, a Walmart and declare yourself the ruler of the Walmart. If you, if you want to rule the Walmart, you really have to earn the consent of the governed. You really have to gather people around and, and those people truly hold the power. You don't hold the power just because you've declared yourself the king and have a few guns. Now, mm-hmm. say, say that again. Or we're born into it. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. And so they start to challenge the idea that because the king says he's the king and he rules, um, it, it really challenges those underpinnings. And then once you get to the American founding, you have now a model to the rest of the world of, of uh, a country being formed out of an empire like Britain on uh, the foundation of individual liberties and natural rights. And so it was a huge epoch in human history when a government declared that we would not be ruled by a king, we would not be ruled by a tribal leader, we would not be ruled by a central authority, we would be ruled by uh, a republic. And, and it would be, derive its power from the people. It would be a republican democracy. Um, now, there had been some forms of democracy and republicanism in ancient Greece and Rome, but if, when you look at like the republic in Rome, it was very corrupt, and when you look at the democracy in Greece, it was very uh, stagnant, and so what the founders tried to do is try to meld all of these ideas, these little threads of liberty into, into a, a system that would allow you and I to be on a podcast talking shit about the government um, without fear of the, the secret police kicking in our door. And right. so we, we think that because some guys in some old dusty powdered wigs, we think that's like ancient history. But that's a fairly new system of government in all of human history. And so libertarianism is mentioned as early, I've seen... H.L. Mencken mentioned it in the 1912s, 1920s in some of his writings. Um, it, it comes out of classical liberalism, which is John Locke, which is the founders, which is John Milton and, and others. Uh, that, is, uh, the, that is the classical liberal tradition. Um, and it's been carried on by people like Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich A. Hayek, F. A. Hayek, uh, Murray Rothbard, um, and and many uh, Ayn Rand, who wrote Atlas Shrugged, which you're reading, would be considered in kind of that tradition of classical republic, uh, classical liberal, um, where you focus on individual rights, free markets, peace. Um, you know, the markets will provide answers for for all of these different things, and so the libertarian movement kind of forms out of that, that stew of that, that strain of thought. So, but it's still a very new idea. And what I always try to impress upon people is that if you're a libertarian, it's your job to learn as much about libertarianism as humanly possible, because this is still an infant idea and one that is fairly counter to the human nature, our human nature. And so if we want future generations to have the same chance at liberty that we've had, you have to understand it and articulately share the message of libertarianism on a consistent basis because it's so different and so new. It's not part of our wiring yet. And so we really have to continue to share the traditions of uh, the fact that you and I own our own bodies. You and I are our own autonomous beings. No one else owns you or me, and that anyone who claims that they have the ability to do something in my name and take my money for it and tell me that if I don't do it, I'm going to jail, that's not freedom. That's not liberty. That is a a messed up form of slavery or indentured servitude. That's taking away my ability to govern myself, and so therefore I reject your authority completely. Um, well, you live in a society that you benefit from blah, blah, blah. I didn't sign any social contract. I'm a fully autonomous being that should have the ability to make my own choices. That's a, rap, that's a radical idea in human history. And so 
when you ask where did libertarianism come from, the short answer to this is that it comes from a lot of people who were tired of being bullied and pushed around and killed and abused and bombed by governments and said, you know what, maybe we shouldn't have this government shit anymore. So historically, a lot of these people who, who wrote about and who believe that, are they, did they, okay, so the, the individual right, did a lot of them or most of them or all of them, did they, did they believe that, you know, God is the one who put that right upon them? Some and others no. Uh, there's, there's the idea that everyone who existed before 1975 was just super religious. And that's just not the case. I mean, religion has been... Um, the, the idea that America is a religious Christian nation, yes, Christianity, Christianity was certainly a big part of our founding, but it also was... That idea was really ramped up during the Cold War to make us look like a more moral nation than the Soviet Union. So we get to do whatever we want to them because we're moral and they're not. Um, people like John Locke or John Adams were very religious. But, you know, Thomas Jefferson was not as religious. Ben Franklin, I don't think, was very religious at all, quite frankly, the amount of orgies that he went to. Um, so, so the idea of natural rights doesn't, it isn't dependent upon a creator. I believe that it, it, it's, if you breathe, if you are a human being, you are deserving of dignity, respect, and uh, the ability to rule yourself. Mm -hmm. um, now, does that right come from the fact that God created me, or does that right come from the fact that I am just an autonomous breathing creature? Uh, you can pick either one, but it doesn't change the fact that because I breathe, I am an autonomous creature of, that is supposed to have self-government. So... Mm -hmm. I, in my mind, it isn't dependent upon uh, a creator for natural rights to exist. You know, God-given rights or natural rights, it just, you have them because you're born. So mm -hmm. how you got here or what spurred that is really irrelevant to the fact that you just exist. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm just, uh, sorry, I'm just thinking to myself, like, how... I mean, I'm, I'm personally, I'm agnostic. So I'm, I'm just trying to ask myself where would, you know, why do I feel that? Why do I feel like I should just leave people alone, let them do what they want? I mean, I feel that way, but it's like, I, a lot of people say it's a natural right from God. And I'm just thinking, well, if people don't, if some people don't believe that, then how would you explain that to them? not in those words but i mean yeah i mean simply because we exist i i i mean that's how i feel so sure i don't know right you don't i'm probably you, not explaining myself well but <laughs> no i i get it i think you i think that a lot of the people who talk about natural rights especially in the last decade have come from the tea party and the tea party was hell-bent at a certain point on turning america into a theocracy <laughs> And, and for Sam, looking at a book right now by David Barton called Original Intent. And the whole point of his book is to show that the founders formed us as a Christian nation, and therefore we need to be a, a religious people. It's called dominionism. And that's just not the, the reality. Yes, Christianity is a part of our country's heritage, and a lot of our laws are founded on Judeo-Christian principles, but it doesn't mean that you have to be religious uh, to believe in the ideas of liberty. You, you can just be uh, an, an agnostic like yourself and say, I don't have all that worked out with God right now, but the reality is that I deserve to have self-government and the freedom to choose what I believe about religion without someone on the right telling me that I need to be a Christian or someone on the left telling me I need to be an atheist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So, 
there's still a lot of opinions that I'm trying to work out. You know, I've been thinking of a lot of things from a libertarian perspective, trying to issues that I hear. And there are just some things that I can't wrap my head around how our society would work if we dealt with these things from a libertarian perspective. <laughs> so I'm just kind of curious, you know, from your point of view or other point of views you've heard, like how we would deal with, you know, certain things. Okay. Um, I'll, give it, I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> uh, one of them being age of consent. And I've heard some people talk about this, you know, like, um, uh, who was it? It was, it was one of your candidates. Arvin. Actually, yeah. a, couple, a couple of them I heard talking about how, you know, you can just think of their mental ability. And if they act older or they act younger, you know, based off that. But, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking on a day-to-day -day basis. I feel like a lot of, like, you know fucked up shit could happen that it would be really hard to use that as a basis so would it i'm just curious how how that could work if we i don't believe that we should have an arbitrary number but also on the other side how would it work on a day-to-day -day basis in cases where you have um you know 13 year olds being passed around willingly like 12 year olds or 13 year olds who are so young and they're willingly being passed around to people. Would we just, you know, say well, that's okay. They're willing They're. I, I would personally not No, And I don't agree with those presidential candidates uh, on a lot of this. And I think there, and I'm not saying this about them specifically. I'm saying that there is a bit of a vibe that when I hear libertarians talk about this subject, I go, are you asking for permission? Because there's a bit of that kind of coming across. But um, it, it, so this is definitely one of those things that is like, it's hard to talk about because it is like a, a creepy subject, right? And so you, you hit on the arbitrary number thing. And first of all, there is no perfect system. And so what I think a lot of people, when they talk about politics, they're looking at it from a utilitarian perspective, which means results oriented. And we think that we can design the perfect government that will protect all children, that will protect all adults, that will, that will guarantee that when you come home at the end of the day, you will be safe, secure, happy, your property will still be there, and you'll walk in the door because you're not dead. That's just not the human condition, and that's not the reality of the world. And so, when I, when I hear someone say something like you just said, which is, I, I'm worried about these results if we go to this system, I always ask back, do you think that that's not happening now under the system that has a lot of rules? Because it is. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, the system that we have now, just because we wouldn't have as many laws in a lot of areas, it doesn't mean that you're going to get worse results because usually the results right now are pretty terrible. That's why we're all looking for a different solution. So that's always one counter that I have kind of to that notion. Now, this particular issue, you need to look, so there's two, two, two ways to look at it from a libertarian perspective in, in kind of your worldview. There is the directionist perspective and the destination perspective, okay? The destination libertarian is like those presidential candidates that you mentioned. I as, a I, as a destination libertarian, believe that I'm going to articulate what a libertarian society would look like. I'm going to say the radical things, and I'm going to let you sort out in your mind what you can tolerate and what you can stand. And then there's the directional libertarian who maybe a lot of libertarian party people fit into, and that I want to move us in a more libertarian direction. So I'm going to point out the flaws in this particular policy, advocate for a better policy, but not advocate that we should abolish all government. And so a lot of people start out as a directional libertarian and end up as a destination libertarian. I myself have kind of found myself on that journey. The more that I do this, the more that I talk into a microphone, I find that people want to know what is the radical solution of what is, what is the future look like as opposed to what's wrong with now. They want more hope and less change. Um, now, 
when it comes to the age of consent discussion, you can look at it from a directional libertarian perspective. Uh, here in Indiana, it's 16. Okay. In some states, it's 18. Some states, it's probably 17. I don't, I don't know all the, I'm not Miranda, the type of guy who knows age of consent laws in every state. Yeah. <laughs> I tend to, so, but I know it's 16 here in Indiana. Now, as an arbitrary number, that, that seems pretty reasonable. Now, at 18, for instance, you get into some pretty weird situations. So you end up with the 19-year-old guy who has sex with a 17-year-old girlfriend and then gets charged with statutory rape. That sounds far-fetched. It happens all the time. Why? Because under the 1994 crime bill that Bill Clinton passed that's being talked about, you, you had to have a certain number of crimes, sex crimes, prosecutions, and additions to the National Sex Regist Registry, Sex Offender Registry, to get federal funding. And so what you had through the 90s and 2000s were a lot of local prosecutors, when they would have in the past said, no, I'm not going to charge little Billy because he's 19. I'm not going to wreck his life because he had sex with a 17-year-old girlfriend. You then had incentivized prosecutors to be harsher and put 19-year-old Billy on the sex offender list. And then you end up with a lot more sex offenders, a lot more sex criminals. And the, the fallout, the social cost of that is huge. So the social cost is way more than the loss of the tax dollars to the local prosecutor's office that coming from the federal funds. So that's an inherent problem with, this, with the age of consent that a directional libertarian might take up. Then there is the destination libertarian who will say, this is an arbitrary number. Every individual is different. And it's up to the parents to be good parents to make sure that their child is not in a dangerous situation. And, it, and it's up to communities to set those standards. Um, you know, in a libertarian society, in the way that I envision uh, the future, and, and this kind of fits into a broader discussion of law and how it would operate, you, you living in North Dakota really shouldn't care about anything that happens in my life in Indiana. Like, yeah, we're on this Zoom call right now, but for me to argue about things that affect you directly is sort of silly, right? So the way that it would work is we kind of revert back to those local communities. And so you would move into a community and you would, you would kind of agree to a set of legal principles and say, these are the rules. These are the, the ways, these are the values of the community. These are the laws and you agree to abide by these or we're going to uh, ask you to leave or in terms of syndicalism or we're going to punish you or put you in prison if you harm someone or steal their property or commit fraud. Uh, and so age of consent laws would largely in, a, in an, a libertarian, pure libertarian society would be handled by the local community. You would move into a community where, you know, sort of like an HOA. <laughs> I know home, homeowners associations are, are vilified, but that's in a lot of ways how I think it would break down eventually. You'd voluntarily join on to a set of laws and age of consent would, fit, would probably factor into that. And of course, there's going to end up being those societies where there are no age of consent laws and it's going to attract a lot of gross dirt bags. Um, but we're we're already kind of there. Like there's there's no perfect system to protect everybody. The best way to protect everybody is to give people the opportunity to protect themselves and their family and give them a greater sense of involvement in the community and uh, give them economic opportunity where we work together and uh, my job is dependent on your job and that will solve a lot of these ills. So I don't know that that, probably satisfies i'll ask you if it satisfies your curiosity because there was a lot in there but if i'm going to give you a full understanding i think i need to give you both perspectives uh i don't think there's a great answer um because yeah. there's there's problems with the way that we do it now and there's problems with the way that we'd probably do it in the future yeah that's true. I mean, I, I understand, I understand what you're saying, how, you know, we could just go back to the local community things, but 
I feel like that's just something I can't envision the way everybody's so connected nowadays. Like you said, we're on a Zoom call right now and we're, you know, however many miles away and it's like people are so naturally, you know, controlling. I It's just hard for me to see, you know, people letting it go states away if they hear about sex trafficking, you know, states away. I feel like I feel like people, people just don't, don't do, yeah, people go. don't do a good job of minding their business, which is why a lot, why a lot of libertarians kind of land at constitutionalism, like Austin Peterson, for instance. You know, let's get back to the way that the country was founded. That that gives us a good legal framework for dealing with problems like this. You deal with it in your local state, your your local, you know, and what perverted the entire system to begin with on in terms of age of consent was the federal government introducing the crime bill, for instance. So, so that's why there are libertarians who kind of fall into constitutionalism. I consider libertarian to be a broad term, not just meaning anarchism. Um, and so that's, that is kind of why some libertarians end up at what's called minarchism or constitutionalism. It's just a loose government that kind of does law, basically. It, it lays out basic... It protects natural rights, protects kids in this particular instance. And so, yeah, because so, there are a lot of people who just can't get to that place where like, I just can't, I got to have my little security blanket of law somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I get that. Um, another thing that I, I was just kind of well, curious. Let me ask, cause I feel like it didn't totally satisfy, but I, I don't feel that I can. So well, I, feel, I mean, question? I kind of, I see that there's multiple different things that you can think of. And since, I mean, if it was a libertarian society, I mean, it is pretty open and case by case. And if, yeah. if you're just, if it's going to be different everywhere, then it's just, it's just going to vary no matter what. So which it, which it does that. now. Yeah, and most people will live in a assist, in a place that has some legal framework. Yeah, so most, most people are going to choose within to live in a place that has a legal legal framework that protects them and their kids and their property. So I, I don't think that we would be yeah. without law. I think you would voluntarily work on those laws with the people that you're around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like things that go really far i think as a society we tend to be good about you know demonizing that ourselves without the government having to be there anyway so yeah in my mind somebody who has manipulated a 13 year old girl or boy into being uh, a sex object that person's committing a crime and yeah. just because we have a united states government or we have an anarchist government i want that person prosecuted like that anarchism or you know a more pure form of libertarianism does not mean lawlessness mm -hmm. yeah yeah i i can see that and it's even if we didn't have i feel like even if we didn't have a system to prosecute people for that we would just kind of shun them anyway You're like, right yeah my laptop is about to die i'm gonna go grab a charger real quick Okay. I'm going to yeah, take this. No, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with that. I'm okay, good. Well, while you do that, I'm going to thank our patrons for this episode. I want to thank Jason Doolittle, Craig DaCosta, the Libertarian Coalition. Go join their Facebook group and like their Facebook page. Christy Avery and intern Ed Brehab. Thank you guys so much for being patrons. Thanks to all of our patrons for joining us here on uh, We Are Libertarians and making uh, things like this possible. <laughs> Uh, these kind of conversations where we're trying to work out things that it's not just Miranda that we're talking to, we're talking to thousands of people will hear this episode and uh, hopefully through 2020, we'll create a lot of new libertarians or help new libertarians understand what they believe. So that is all made possible because our patrons pay the bills, which you can join our Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. Just click on support or click on the Patreon and you can join today. And uh, without our patrons, we wouldn't do this anymore because the bills are way too expensive for me to shoulder uh, like I did back in the day when it was $50 a month. It's hundreds of dollars a month to operate a platform this big. We're looking at several big projects, a couple new shows. And so it's more important now than ever before for you to join our Patreon. So 
Uh, thank you for getting your cable so I could pay the bills, Miranda, but we're back to you. What is your next question? Um, so I honestly don't know much about how much the federal government is involved with banking, Ooh. but maybe could I, could you just explain a little bit how, how much they are, how, how much they are involved in it and Would you be surprised to know that the Federal Reserve that prints your money and is in control of the United States money supply is not officially a part of the federal government? Yeah, that is, I, I would be surprised. Is it just a separate, it's a whole separate entity? It was, it is a basically a cartel of the major banking institutions operate the Federal Reserve with oversight from the United States Congress, and, and that is the extent of it. So it was formed in 1913. All bad things happened in 1913. If you wonder, why does this suck? It started in 1913 under Woodrow Wilson when a group of bankers met on uh, an island called Jekyll Island. There's a book called The Creature of Jekyll Island, if you want to kind of know. Uh, G. Edward Griffin wrote this great biography, basically, of how all this formed. The creature of Jekyll Island? From Jekyll Island, yeah. Jekyll and he's a good writer, too. So, and it basically kind of talks about the formation of the Federal Reserve and how you and I are not in control of our own money supply. And when you look at inflation of the U.S. dollar from then until now, it's massive. And especially since 1972 when Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. And what that means is that when you hold a dollar that paper dollar, it's backed now by the full faith and credit of the United States. And it used to be backed by a dollar worth of gold in Fort Knox. And so we went from tying our money from a tangible asset to the full faith and credit of the United States government. Now, Miranda, I ask you, how much faith do you have in the United States government? Not, not very much. <laughs> Hence, why not your dollar is, <laughs> Hence why your dollar is getting more expensive. And so I, I always like to give this example. When my dad graduated in the early 70s or mid 70s from high school, a car was $5,000 and a house was $70,000. When I graduated uh, high school in 2002, a car was $20,000 and a house was $150,000. You know, when you graduated high school, um, like a decade later, $30,000. And so it's, it, it's it, that inflation is a hidden tax on our money. And so there's a, a ser very serious problem. Now, I'm going to say this. You've asked a very complicated question. And so I'm not going to give you a very long, complicated answer uh, because, A, I don't feel I'm qualified to do that. I'm not an economist and I don't know much about economics. I got a full, I got a hard C in economics in high school. I'm much more of a history person and a policy and politics person. Um, but there are many great uh, books like The Creature of Jekyll Island, Mises and Murray Rothbard have put out a lot of good books on um, the, the current banking system. You could get lost in libertarian land on this specific question forever. Um, you know, we kind of talked about what would money look like in the future? Uh, Bitcoin, I think, is a great illustration of how money might work. Uh, there is, it's, it's going to be real hard for me to explain Bitcoin too. Uh, you've asked me a very tough question. But when you, when you look at Bitcoin, for instance, there's an incentive for you to get involved in Bitcoin. I got a message from somebody a couple days ago who said, I want to know more about cryptocurrency. Can you explain it to me? I threw 25 bucks into the till to see if it'll go up to 50. And so this person is investing in a currency essentially uh, because they think that it's a good investment for them. Now the inverse could be true. They'll flee if they don't think that it's a good investment, if they don't understand what the currency is totally about. But you have a currency in Bitcoin that is backed by uh, there's like 20, let's, I think it's like 20 million Bitcoins and you can have fractions of those bits of those Bitcoins, but you, you will never have more than 20 million Bitcoins. And so there's a stable supply 
of Bitcoins, even if it moves up and down. But there's a financial interest and you've seen Bitcoin over time kind of grow into something. I was at the airport the other day and I saw a Bitcoin ATM. Somebody felt that it is a good enough investment to get involved in Bitcoin to build an ATM system. And I'm guessing that's not the only ATM for Bitcoin that this person has invented and put in place. And so the people are getting engaged in a currency that is detached from any central government. And so people in Venezuela are using Bitcoins to actually pay for their basic living expenses. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so, so you don't necessarily need a government to issue money when you have, like, what is money? Money is really a symbol. When you get paid for your paycheck, from your, in your paycheck, that is a symbol for your time and labor. And so you give your time and labor to your boss and he gives you money. And, you know, I, I was watching the John Adams series on HBO, which is great. And he's growing his own food as he's practicing law because he, he has to grow his own food. And at a certain point in human history, we said, you know what? It's really hard practicing law and being a vice president and growing my own food and taking care of my kids. What can I do to do this differently? And so what capitalism does is, <clears throat> is it, it, it takes a person's interest. There's somebody, Miranda, that wakes up every single day excited to grow okra. I could care less about growing anything. There's somebody excited to wake up to produce, uh, to, to play basketball. I could care less about playing basketball. I don't know. What, what, would you like to say what you do for a living? Um, yeah, I work in a water testing lab. Okay, that sounds boring as hell and I would never do it. But I'm so glad you do it so I don't have to. Because you provide a, a fabulous service to the people in your area to make sure that their water is tested well. I have no interest in doing that. And so what money does is it allows us to take our time and labor and spread it out and pay for interest that we might not have. And so it doesn't really matter if the, the symbol is a United States dollar or a Bitcoin. Uh, capitalism will always need some currency to, to operate. But uh, it doesn't need to necessarily be issued by the United States government, which it's not. It's uh, you, you and I are being taxed to death through inflation. Uh, and it's because bankers are getting rich off of you and me at the exp and the politicians are helping. So if, if we did um, move away from the federal government handling that, uh, let's say we use Bitcoin for the most part, you know, in the future, what, I mean, doesn't, can't that quickly lose value? I mean, wasn't there a point in time where it lost a lot of value and a lot of people lost a lot of money from that? Yes. And I don't have, I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. I, you've reached the, the extent of my knowledge okay. on this <laughs> because that is a problem that I have with this as well. Okay. Um, in that, I had Bitcoins and I made 50 bucks and then I got out of Bitcoin and then it tanked and then it went back up. And, you know, but if you look at foreign exchanges, dollars and euros, everything floats. It's it, the argument that people make for, you, you, you know, government backed currency is that it's more stable. Um, but there's also the reality is that with a lot of libertarian solutions, there's some unknown because some of the smartest minds in the world are not l working on these solutions. There's a few that are. The very smart people are going to try because they have the, the best self-interest is to go get a job, go to Harvard and get a job at the Federal Reserve because that's the ruling regime, right? So <clears throat> those people who um, put their minds towards fixing American currency have not put their minds towards fixing cryptocurrency, for instance. So uh, in a lot of ways, once, once people turn their self-interest to private market solutions, a lot of these problems may get worked out because you have a lot more people working on solving problems. Humans as a species are very, very good problem solvers. It, 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 you know, we will always figure out the best way to make money and to advance the species and to advance our own lives. 
and not enough people are working on a lot of these solutions because there's not a lot of um, bone. There's not a lot of benefit. Like Satoshi, who created Bitcoin, did it out of love for a principle. There's very few people who just do things because they love a principle, right? They do it because they want to make money. Now I'm sure Satoshi some are doing fine, but um, it, it, so I don't know the answer, but that doesn't mean that somebody listening is going, ah, it's this and blah, blah, blah. But that may be my counter to it is that once we add more people to using this stuff, it'll get a lot more stable. Mm -hmm. um, so I, with loans, um, does the government, okay, I know they control, you know, I hear them talking about the, fed, the interest rate, you know, for federal, federal loans, but do, I mean, do they have any controlling do they control interest rates of private banks? Is, is that a thing or? Uh, so if you and I, I don't totally know the answer to this. I'll give you my okay. best guess, okay? Uh, there is, like when you hear the interest rates being adjusted at the Fed, that's the money that I think that banks come and purchase from the Fed. So like they, they, they exchange money or they exchange something and that 1% is their, their exchange window, the special window for the bank. But a bank has the freedom to charge based on your credit report, 2% mm -hmm. uh, for a car loan or 25% for a car loan. I'm sure there's probably some laws, some loan shark laws that prohibit some of that. But like when you're dealing with private loans, like you and I would be dealing with a lot of that is not, tampered with by the government, I don't think. I think that's just the bank saying, here's where, based on your credit worthiness, here's what we'll lend you. And the money. banks are, banks take loans from the Federal Reserve. Yes, right. They buy, they buy treasury bonds and stuff like that. So again, we're kind of hitting the, the ceiling. Yes. I, that I've okay. Got. Yeah. Ho I'm hopefully, sorry hopefully if, no, no, you're fine. If, uh, do you mind me saying your last name? Uh, yeah, I don't care. Okay, so if you're listening to this and you're going, Spangle's such an idiot, go into the Facebook group and tag Miranda Keller, and uh, it's M-I-R-A-N-D-A-K-E-L-L-E-R. -L -L -E no, no creepers. I'm telling you right now, if I get one message from Miranda that you guys slid in her DMs, I'm going to be pissed. Uh, you're married, right? You have a boyfriend, right? Yeah. Okay, leave her alone. <laughs> uh, so the, I, I hope you lied, even if you... <laughs> So, but tag her in the group and say, hey, Spangle's an idiot. Here's the answer to that question. Okay. Um, yeah, so another thing I'm just kind of curious if we kick the government out of uh, in, in environmental issues. Mm -hmm. Now, like I said before, um, I used to have a really hard time picturing a world without environmental laws. I mean, I just... I think of all the examples before of, you know, of course, you know, what they always talk about, lakes and rivers catching on fire and whatnot, you know, who's, who's to say they can't do that. And I know that today really all they're doing is getting a permit for polluting, but if we didn't have some type of overseer, I mean, are we just going to have people owning parts of rivers, like certain sections of rivers? like to be able to, you know, use property rights as a, as a way to mitigate that? Yes. Uh, and so here's why you always have to think of things in terms of interest, self-interest. Okay. If let's, you should go back and listen to our wildfire episode. It was not one of our best downloaded uh, episodes because not a lot of people feel like uh, every, Everything I do has to be relevant to you, okay? And so if it's not relevant to you, you don't listen to it. So a lot of people didn't listen to the wildfire episode because they don't live in a place with wildfires. But we talk a lot about this. And what you find in uh, the wildfires, why wildfires are increasing in places like California specifically is because a lot of that land is controlled by the government. And private land is always better taken care of because of several reasons. 
when you were a, let's say you own your house versus you're living in your parents' house, which do you feel more of a responsibility to take care of? Your house or your parents' house when you were a kid? Uh, definitely my own house. <laughs> right. Why? Uh, I guess because, I mean, it, it's the sole responsibility of me. So how it looks and how it. There's consequences, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you don't take care of it, there's consequences. But yeah. if you don't take care of your room at your parents' house and you ding a wall, they're going to take care of it. Yeah. And it's responsibility. Or, and, and we sort of make the error that we think that a person who works for the government in the Forest Service is just donning the hat every morning to go out and protect God's land. And they wake up excited to do their job. And no, these are bureaucrats. These are people who have government jobs who wake up, who are pissed at their boss and don't think that they're getting enough in their pension. And they kind of hate themselves for getting into this boring ass career. It's sort of like the border agents. We think all oh, these brave border agents are out there protecting us uh, from invaders. It's like, no, these border agents are in detention centers, not letting children go to the bathroom and not letting milk bottles be washed out for infants. But like, we- I, we I cried listening to your episode about that. Mm. I'm sorry you had to cry listening to that episode. I teared up too. And it's, it, that last episode was really tough. I mean, it's really hard to hear the results of a government bureaucracy. Yeah. You know, and and many in many ways, the EPA and other agencies, the alphabet soup, you know, even CPS, as I talked about in that last episode, we have the idea that someone else is taking care of this for us. It's done in our name, so we're controlling it. We can vote in politicians and there will be better. You know, it again goes to bat, what to what you identified early, which was so smart and so good on your part and so insightful because it's so true. We're a, we're a species of control freaks. And we think that because we have tax money going to protecting the wilderness and the environment and, and all these other things that it's being protected. But the problem is the nature of bureaucracy constrains resources and the people who are the victims of those constrained resources, mainly the people who are charged with doing X job tend to end up not doing a very good job because the constrained resources means they're getting paid less and they're watching their other private sector uh, friends get paid a lot more for doing the same type of work. And so they do, they, it, it's diminishing returns. And so when we put the government in charge of something like protecting lands in California, decisions end up not being made on public land, like burning brush. Well, 15 politicians said, no, we can't do that because that puts carbon into the air because of global warming. And so we don't burn the brush. And then, and then it just leads to confusion. So nobody does anything and they're mad about it because they want to do something, but they can't and they don't get paid enough to really care enough. And so everything just gets worse. But when you have private owned land, it's much better taken care of. Because the incentive is to do a good job and take care of the land. And people do wake up every morning going, I am so lucky that I get to do this job. And they're, and they're more satisfied in their work. And people like you who care about the trees will donate to, to charities that take care of the land. And so you could have a big private park with volunteers that manage a Yosemite-sized park. Uh, with volunteers and, and, you know, you already pay to get in the park, but pay $10 extra to get into the park. And then you can hire more service uh, staff for the park. And so it, it's, we think that if we go to a private society, we're going to lose a lot, but you're really going to gain more because there's going to be more jobs and the people who are working in those jobs are more fulfilled and they're being paid more, which means then those people are then buying more stuff and going to more places and doing more things or listening to more podcasts and joining Patreons. So we shouldn't be afraid of the unknown because the known isn't good enough. And so maybe we have a better shot on the other, other end. There's a couple episodes in, in the dailies. Uh, there's one that you might like that uh, Hody and Paul did on, I think it's called who would save the trees. It's a daily episode. And then also the wildfire that might answer some more questions along these lines. 
-hmm. But yeah, I think that just because, you know, we have this idea that the EPA came in and came in and that's what saved the, the rivers in, in uh, Pittsburgh. No, it's the company that got bad press. You know, I saw a Johnson and Johnson ad touting how green they are now. Well, no government put a gun to the head of the Johnson and Johnson marketing department and said, you need to market that you're responsible and green. No, because it's good for their bottom line. They started to do things that were more environmentally friendly. Think about when you were, when you 10 years ago versus now, how much more organic food and organic products are there? Yeah, there's, there's tons. Right. And so you have a lot more economic, you have a lot more sustainable choices and green choices in every category in the grocery store because you made the choice with your dollars to vote for something different. And so the market within 10 years has rapidly expanded into a multitude of products. If the government were in charge of making sure that everybody was green and started fining companies and taking away capital, you're not going to get an expanding category of products. You're going to get less products and companies going out of business and people losing their jobs because of the fines, because they're losing capital. So government intervention in this manner never works well. The markets will end up providing better choices. Yeah. Okay. So any, any thoughts or questions yeah. on that? Not really. Um, I don't know. And I wasn't a supporter of the Green New Deal, by the way. That was... Have you, have you listened to that, that episode? No. I, well, I read it back when it when they first proposed it, actually, that was one of the, that was one of the things that, that made me step back and say, wow, what the fuck is going on in our government? You go, like, you should go who, listen to the Green New Deal episode. Like, over? like it, to me, all I got from it was like, yeah, there's a little bit of stuff about climate change and then bam, we're taking over everything. <laughs> they literally want to control every house building Domicile, every, every single square inch of the country, everything you do, all hiring, it's insane. Like there's no way it would happen. No way it would happen yeah. without without going into like hundreds of trillions of dollars in debt and that. Yeah. And it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. But that's not the goal. The goal is the goal is not to save the environment. The goal is to control every aspect of your life because Ocasio Cortez <laughs> thinks she knows better than you. Yeah, that was that was crazy, but um, no, that that's not my idea of of environmentalism at all. But um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of some stuff. And I, I mean, if if we moved away from government protected areas like Yellowstone, I mean, we would basically have to just rely on, I mean, like you know, rich people to buy up that land, right? And voluntarily say, I want to protect this land. You, I mean, that's basically how it would be, right? You think they don't already? <laughs> like, uh, go back, go back I, to the early parts of this. Know, really. Yeah, I mean, you would, you would end up with these parks being in private foundations' hands. You'd end up with maybe not one rich person owning it, but nonprofits owning a lot of these spaces. I think you'd end up with, in, in the way that a lot of there's so much more research in this country funded by billionaires donating to private charity like you're going you're going to have nonprofits running these areas uh and you know i don't think that like going to the yellowstone park is a bad experience like i, I mean this is one of those areas where it's like we beat up on the government a lot like the the clean restrooms at yosemite is not one of those places we should start but <laughs> But I don't, I don't think that it's, it's, you're going to have a small group of powerful people owning the parks versus now where a small group of powerful people own the parks. They, and they can, put a, they can put a gun to your head and charge you more and do it more ineffectively. Yeah. And they take your money for it anyway. anyway. Right. And you have to pay on top of it. Yeah. You you would you would you care about this? I don't. So you pay for it. Why should I? And like, you would be more invested in going and making sure that your money, your donations, are spent correctly. 
Like private charity makes better citizens, more engaged citizens, because you care what's happening to your money. You don't feel that way when the government does something. You feel resentment. Yeah. So less happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So another thing I, I was kind of thinking about. So there are things like affirmative action that I disagree with mm -hmm. um, because I think that just creates an unfair advantage to everyone else. I, I think it should be blind. I think the hiring process should be blind, but I mean, that's going to be a business's personal decision. But so I'm with disabled people. Um, we are currently, you know, not allowed to, um, Oh my gosh, I can't even think of that word. Discrimination? Discriminate, good Lord. Uh, <laughs> discriminate against the disabled people, you know, getting jobs. If, if we didn't have that law, I mean, do you think there would be more disabled people or more, you know, poor people, underprivileged people who would just be kind of like kicked out of a lot of different sectors because of that? Or do you think it would just kind of... I, I don't think... <sighs> My best, I'm not educated on a bunch of statistics and, and I don't have a lot of facts and figures, so I'm going to tell you my gut. My gut tells me that discrimination, I mean, let's be honest, discrimination happens regardless of the laws. Like right. there, yeah. you know, we, we've already seen that with uh, what was the book Freakonomics, where they basically did a study where they showed that if you had a black sounding name versus a white sounding name, uh, you you had a lesser chance of getting hired. Your application probably went in the trash can. I, I remember working in high school with a bunch of Korean War vets at the Ace Hardware, you know, a bunch of like greatest generation guys and a long haired hippie guy would come in and want to fill out an application. They'd, they'd fill out the application. They'd throw it right in the garbage. Now, you can't say to the guy, don't fill out an application. You're not welcome here. That would be illegal. But throwing away his application is legal. You can do that. So discrimination already takes place. The, the idea that we're ever going to devise a society based on force and have it be egalitarian is foolish. And egalitarian, for, for those who don't know, may, it, fair and equal, basically. You know, that everybody has an equal start and end. Um, the reality is that discrimination will always take place. And it's, it's not discrimination is not a wholly owned subsidiary of white people. You know, everybody discriminates. And so the, when a corporation, uh, when a corporation does something that is seen as racist, what happens now? They get demonized. Everybody knows about it, right? Yeah. When a student picks on a Down syndrome, student and it's caught on video what happens you see it on facebook you see it everywhere right because our values as a society are not the same values as 100 years ago it's much more humane like the reality of the world that we're living in is that the information age has made us a lot more tolerant of people different than ourselves and a lot more curious about lives that we don't live like you can turn on HBO Real Sex and watch a bunch of weirdos doing things that I would never get caught doing, Miranda. But I'll watch because I'm like, well, that's different. You know what I mean? Like there's, or Vice. You watch Vice on HBO and you see people doing things that you just go, why would they? I don't get it. What the information age has allowed human beings to do is to kind of exercise that curious part of our brain and understand other cultures and other, other worldviews, we've become a much more tolerant society. What makes us intolerant is government. And so you right now, when, what is the thing that you don't want to see on your Facebook feed, Miranda? Um, I, I What's know. the generic subject that everybody hates on their Facebook feed? Starts with the P president no that yeah exactly Poli <laughs> politics Most oh people, yeah <laughs> right and why do I mean, we I, go ahead oh i was just gonna say i i really don't mind 
actually seeing politics on there. I see what I do hate is a lot of like partisan bashing is what I what I what I don't really like seeing. Yeah. We have we we hate it. We feel we have to defend something. And so gay marriage, for instance, is, is I'll use this as an example. I mean, it's kind of settled at this point. But the reason that the Christian right felt that they had to defend traditional marriage is because their tax dollars and their way of life was, they felt that it was a different way of life was being forced on them. And the gay community felt rightly that they weren't allowed to live their lives as they see fit because they were being oppressed by Christian lawmakers. And so everybody had this life and death struggle over these issues because what we're really arguing over is government force. Do you have the right to point a gun at my head and force me to live the way that you think I ought to live? Or do I get to just live as I see fit as long as I don't steal your stuff, hit you, defraud you in a business deal? And so what why politics is just and government is an inherently bad way to solve these societal issues is that it makes people feel that they have to wrestle control of the government because force is behind it. And what I mean by that is if you get a parking ticket, what happens? You, you get fined. What happens when you don't pay that fine? You get another fine and then you get put in contempt of court and then you get put in jail for contempt of court. And so when the government does something, it's not asking you to do something. It's telling you to do something. Mm -hmm. And so when people try to pass laws to make others live as the lawmaker wants them to live, they get resentful and it creates division. And so instead of a society that's built around economic mutual interest, where I voluntarily work with Miranda to then uh, create, it's, I don't know, have you ever heard of iPencil? Do you know what that is? No. Okay. So it's this famous uh, essay. And it basically talks about spontaneous order, where you have a pencil in front of you. And the pencil, the, the wood comes from the Pacific Northwest. The, the lead in the pencil comes from, you know, the Congo. The zinc in the, in the metal band or the aluminum comes from India. And the rubber comes from South America. And nobody designed the pencil there's no patent for the pencil it's it's just a problem was wow. that i need i need to write something mm -hmm. and so therefore i need to create something to write with they create it and then they go wow my hand's black so let me put some wood around this thing and then oh i i figured out that i can use rubber to get rid of this and over time uh this pencil spontaneously appears and it takes its present form and it's done because there's problems and then there's solutions. And the, the person who's living in South Africa mining the minerals works with a person in the Pacific Northwest and they have a mutual interest in being respectful towards each other. But once you say, once you put a gun to each other's head and say, you're going to work for me and do what I want you to do or else, that creates a whole different dynamic. And that's the problem that we have when we try to solve a lot of these issues with government. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thinking of if we move to a society where we got rid of those laws, I just feel like we have went so far. How do we take that away? How do we take away discrimination laws or even welfare, even a special, how do we take away these things without people being resentful towards that. I mean, you will always you have, yeah, I think two great examples happened in the 20th and 21st century, the civil rights movement and the LGBT rights movement. You know, I lived through the LBGT. I mean, you know, I'm 35 and so I'm relatively young. Uh, even though you probably think I have old man smell at 24, but uh, you know, don't shake your head. Yes. How dare you? Um, but when I was in high school, and maybe even when you were in high school, it wasn't, it wasn't cool to be gay. Like, there's, there's definitely a shift uh, towards the uh, LGBT lifestyle in, in high schools today. You know, 
I grew up in an era where it was okay to say the F word. I mean, it was just everybody said it and it doesn't make it right. And it was, uh, it was just different. And it's, and I know that's, like, oh, it's a different time. It's almost cliche, but like, I didn't know any gay people. I was totally ignorant of it. And then I watched Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. The original one, not this abomination that is taking place now, but the original one. And I went, oh, those are gay people? Oh, well, they seem fun. There's nothing wrong with them. You know, and then I kind of changed my attitude. And then I uh, went to college and I, ha I met some gay friends. And I was like, I don't know what we're all pissed off about. These people are fabulous. And then, you know, as you started to see the Republican Party and the Christian church, like, really get mad in 2004 about all this stuff, and you go, well, I don't, I don't get it. Like, what do you care if this guy goes and marries this guy? It's not hurting you. And then you start to hear stories about, well, they, you know, and, and I was like, ah, but I know marriage is a bridge too far, domestic partnership, cool. I had the same exact stance as Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and eventually you start to hear like, oh, well, if they aren't married, then they can't go in the hospital room or they can't do this. And you just go, you know what? This is all stupid. Let them just be free. And so then I started advocating locally and nationally for a change in policy. It's like, I don't believe the government should be involved in marriage, but until we get the government out of marriage, everyone should have full and equal access to the law. And so a law didn't change my behavior or my heart. I changed the law. You changed the law with your behavior. The South, <coughs> the South, for all the talk about the Civil Rights Act, it was public opinion that forced the Civil Rights Act and, and intervention in Southern uh, localities. Because America saw Martin Luther King walking with other black men and some white men and women and they were dressed up nicely and they were being attacked by police dogs and hit with water cannons and mr and mrs america sitting there watching walter cronkite in the evening said you know what i probably wouldn't have a black person in my home but i don't think they should be attacked by dogs these are people too so public opinion radically changed after bull connor started attacking people when violence was used that changed that changed the hearts and minds of the fence sitters essentially so discrimination hasn't been changed because of laws these laws are all implemented because politicians want to curry favor with the groups that represent with the people that represent this stuff so you know kamala harris or, or, or wants to campaign on adding lgbt rights to anti-discrimination laws not because she thinks it's going to change anything, but because she thinks it's going to get her votes in a primary. Um, but the reason that people want it changed is because culture changed our hearts because we were exposed to people different than us and we saw that they're human too. And mm -hmm. it broke through all the dehumanization propaganda around people. And so if you want to end discrimination, you have to give more information. And that will... That will, that was very uh, Jesse Jackson of me. Uh, but you, that's how you end it. You end it with culture. Politics is downstream from culture, is, as uh, Andrew Breitbart used to say. And as Michael Malice says, politics and government are the fourth quarter. If you're using the government to try and change culture, you're, you're losing because we need to get out there and show like libertarians have solutions and that we're normal and that. We're not scary and an, an, uh, an anarchist or agora society is not going to kill you. It's going to actually make you richer and more prosperous and happier. And then eventually people will just accept that our ideas are, are workable because they met nice libertarians who had some reasonable ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious how, how, how we would get rid of those laws like over time. I mean, if we change the culture into thinking this way, I mean, would, would we just naturally say like, stop trying to, you know, fight for our votes and, and you know, like we can handle this ourselves. Like, do we just need to get to that point? Yeah, I think, 
what's going to happen is we're going to naturally evolve out of government as a form of social organization. I think that technology and the information age are going to make people realize that the thing that is making them sad and miserable and broke is government. And so people are just going to, you already see people just opting out of the system, like 20% of the of Americans actually vote for president or something crazy like that. <clears throat> you know, most people just don't engage in the political system at all. Um, and I think eventually over time, maybe not in our lifetime, um, but maybe towards the end of it, people are just going to make government irrelevant and they're just going to ignore it. And it will just be a small part of our culture because people are getting so wealthy so fast because of innovation that it just becomes irrelevant. And so the laws may still be on the books, but it's not enforced because it's really just a toothless tiger. That's the, that's the hopeful scenario. The, the scary scenario is that we have a full scale economic collapse. All of us die and everyone nukes each other. So. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, ah. but, I, I don't I don't see any politician of any stripe ever standing up and saying, you know, we need to end discrimination laws and roll these back. I just don't think that'll ever happen. I mean, it'll just be like the laws in the books here in Indianapolis for horses. Like you can't tie up your horse outside of a bank here in Indianapolis. It's just not relevant to our lives. So it has no meaning. You could probably, uh, you're not going to find anybody tying a horse upside uh, outside of a bank. Just yeah. Nobody observes it. Nobody repealed it. It just doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, but wh I mean, what happens if you know there's a blue wave, you know, next election, and they pass something like healthcare for all? You know, if they're just spending more money on government programs, that's just pushing us back even further. Like, <laughs> well, I mean <laughs> the, the 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 reality is that we're going to have a reckoning at some point. And there's just no, like, there's no comforting way to say this. Like there's just going to be a financial reckoning in this country. And maybe it's in our lifetime or maybe it's in our kids or grandkids lifetime. But like sometime in the next hundred years, we're going to have a depression because you just can't take on all those toxic assets from 10 years ago and print money and spend like this and open up the cookie jar and not have consequences to it. Like there's consequences to it. And so, you know, I think what you'll find in reading the, in reading Rand's Atlas Shrugged is you'll see kind of a future of America. I think you'll kind of see the rapid control, the, basically the fascism, the, the control of businesses and vice versa, the control of businesses over government, the, the coziness that you have between select uh, businesses who kind of represent the official state. Uh, they're private organizations, but they're basically deemed to be the state actors. And you'll just kind of see a, a, a quickening of regulation until finally the whole thing collapses. When that happens, I don't know. But I think that's, I, I, I don't know that we can get enough people to get their shit together before then. But what I think we need to do as libertarians is to do our best to try because on the other end of that collapse, what gets implemented? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. you know, that, that's, that's what the Alex Jones wing thinks. That's what, so what they kind of say is what is happening is intentional, that the global elite and the banking institutions, the corporate media, the highest of the politicians, the mega corporations, they are all in cahoots trying to, create a neo-feudal system where a select few run the world basically and everyone else serves this global state and then uh you know the they intentionally pass policies that hurt or kill people to decrease the population and to speed up the collapse and on the other side of the collapse they will be in charge and we will all be servants of a global state and they keep each other in line through Mutually assured destruction using child porn. So that's the Alex Jones worldview in a nutshell. Hmm. There, there, like when you hear that, you go, well, that seems pretty rational, you know? And, but I just tend to think that if we're heading that direction, a lot of people in this country, was, as I have seen in historical cycles in American history, 
you go through a progressive area era and then it, people go, what the fuck? And snap out of it. And then you go through FDR and they go, what the fuck? And they snap out of it. And then they go through LBJ and they go, what the fuck? And they snap out of it. And so there's always kind of this push and pull. And I think that's actually where we're going to get here in the next 20 years. So we're going to get a group of people once Gen Z and younger millennials like yourself kind of take charge where they're going to go enough of this. Yeah. We're not doing boomer government anymore. Yeah. No, I definitely see, I definitely can see like uh, another revolution coming, like just how far everybody's splitting up and like, like things like the green new deal, like we're not going to let that happen. Like, I just feel like there's too many people that are against that, that at some point we, we are just going to have to stand up Yeah. <laughs> and, and refuse it. And and it's kind of a scary thought, but I feel like that's what would have that's what would have to happen, you know, eventually to if we keep if we keep spending like we are now and if we keep adding to the programs like we are now, like I feel like something big is gonna have to happen eventually. Like bigger than just going to the polls, you know. Yeah. It could happen. I mean, there, there, it, it could happen. I mean, and I think to think that it couldn't happen um, is naive. But I do think that we're kind of, things are, are getting worse and worse. But I, I think we're kind of, if you, if you go watch the Vietnam War by Ken Burns on Netflix, which I cannot recommend enough, it's so good. Uh, you see a society that's completely fractured around the Vietnam War. And we've never really kind of healed from those wounds. But you, most people don't realize there were like 10,000 domestic terrorist bombings in the United States in the early 70s. Like, things were really bad. You know, 20,000 people showing up to riot in certain places. Like, it was assassinations of political uh, uh, people. And, I, I, and we survived that. We, we came out on the other side of that. So I think it's all survivable. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a collapsitarian because I don't want anything to collapse. I don't think, I don't want to see what's on the other side of the collapse. If we can't get more than 1% of the polls. Mm. Yeah. So that, all right. Well, we're about at two hours. Uh, I don't know if you have more questions, but Um, (laughs) I'm glad that it flew by for you. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. I mean, I, so I have, like I said, my family doesn't talk talk politics a lot and most of my friends are left-leaning um I would say probably like 95 percent of my friends are left-leaning and you know this perspective of mine is fairly new I mean just within the whole last year is is when I started really diving into it I feel like since I've been looking into it I feel really charged and I want to spread the word but I don't exactly know how to do that without sounding like really radical to them or like, you know, whoa, this is way out of, way out of nowhere for you. Like, do you know what I mean? Like how, how can I help spread this message without, I guess, sounding totally out in left field? There are a certain portion of your friends that are just going to think that. And from either side and you're just going to have to accept that if you talk politics or if you share a radical message some people aren't going to like it and you may lose some friendships or some friendships may be strained i have personally not lost a lot of friendships i'm i i have become more of a bomb thrower but i don't feel that i'm a bomb thrower in in an angry weird way i feel like i try to do it in a humorous way i try to pull people's minds a little bit to get them to think about things from a different perspective. But I, I, I provoke, but I don't try to be um, angry or mean about it. And I don't know if I always do a good job of that. I don't have a good perception of myself. But I, I have just come to the conclusion, especially over the last year, that I need to say exactly what I think. Usually in public, if I say it, if I would say it in a Facebook private message i should say it in public too especially by virtue of the platform that i have been given due to this audience um 
you know, there are a lot of people and what I have learned in that the bolder that I am, the more courageous I am with my beliefs, the more respectable the group of people are that are telling me, you know, I never like anything because of my position, but I read your stuff all the time and I really agree with you. The people that give you crap are like five commenters. You'll start to see the same names over and over and over. And like, if you can just get to a place mentally where you just go, this person, I'm writing them off, you know, or like I'm thinking of my buddy, John, who I just know John and John's going to have a reaction towards anything that feels leftist. And he's going to be a little Trumpetarian and, and it's just how he is. And it doesn't have to affect our relationship. And like my friend Wilson is a 78 year old gay man who worked for democratic congressmen who were some of the most progressive in, in this, in the Congress in the eighties and nineties. Like he's always going to be a progressive and he's always going to give me shit from a left-wing perspective, but I can maintain a mutual respect with them. Mm -hmm. um, I will, I will tell you that I often, the more spicy a take is, the more likely it is I have unfollowed that post. And I will then go back later and look at the comments when I'm kind of in a mode where I can give it the attention and kind of, sometimes I never go back. Like sometimes it's like, I put thought into what I said I don't need to go read it. I, I don't need to go read comments by people who have picked it apart in seconds as opposed to the hour that I put into writing this. You know, if I put in an hour and you put in two seconds, my opinion isn't going to be shaped a lot by a knee-jerk reaction. You know, you probably didn't do the research that I did. You know, like the, the, the research that goes into these shows, and this has been all off the cuff. Um, I didn't do any research for this. I knew it's kind of what we talk about ahead of time, but like the immigration episodes, there's a lot of research that goes into those. And so if you have just a knee jerk reaction to that, I go, well, where's your research? Cause you're just parroting talking points. So I, I think it, it comes down mainly to knowing what you believe and trying to get a better sense of what you believe. I think when you're early into it or you're unsure of your beliefs, and you're kind of questioning a lot of stuff, you're better off asking a lot of questions or sharing content from people like Reason or Cato or Mises or We Are Libertarians or the Lions of Liberty or people like, if you hear something where you go, man, that changed my mind. That really like, I understand this better or I never saw it that way. You know, sharing it and saying, I had a, th this made me think about things in X way, mm -hmm. you know, that's not necessarily controversial. It's just saying like, I never thought of it this way and letting them doing the heavy lifting. I think you'll get into trouble if you do kind of what I have always done, which is I have a thought, I'm going to make a grand statement and I'm going to cause trouble with it. Uh, and now I look back through my memories on Facebook at stuff I said five years ago and I go, that was stupid. I, I'm I'm much more uh, prolific in what I post now than I was back then. But the stuff that, like, I think about the stuff that I said on this show five years ago, and I go, I was stupid. I listened to I listened to me 15 years ago on the radio, and I go, I don't know anything. Um, and so it's just a progression. And so know what you believe. Know that you'll never be completely satisfied with your intellectual journey. There's always going to be gaps in your knowledge, and you just have to admit, like. I don't know much about fractional banking, man. Like, go look up Mises stuff. Like, go read Rothbard. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but if you have something that you passionately believe, you should talk about it. For me, the border situation is something that I'm passionate about, that I need to talk about. I need to wake people up to what's going on in their name because these are very fundamental rights that our country is violating, and you can't just be okay with that. Mm -hmm. you know, and so I know that this is wrong. I have the evidence. How do I put that into a persuasive, convincing argument? It may take me two hours to lay all of this out, but what is going to persuade people to come to my opinion in a way that is not button pushing? You know, mm -hmm. I think like the Liberty Hangout people, or, uh, you know, the Turning Point USA people, like sometimes, or the Crowder f crowd, like maybe not those people specifically. Liberty Hangout's a great example. I don't know if you know who that is. Mm -mm. Okay, it's like this blog of Trump 
supposed libertarians who literally just post stuff that they know is going to inflame people. Yeah. You know, yeah. and they just want a reaction. So I try to think about it and I go, what is the best way that I can persuade somebody that disagrees with me? How, how can I present my point in a way that will convince a fence sitter? You will never, ever, ever be able to convince your Aunt Donna that brown people should be allowed to come here to this country. You will never be able to convince that one commenter who comments on every post that they're wrong about their worldview. But dozens of people will read your exchanges with those people. I will spend time commenting on Facebook stuff because dozens, if not hundreds of people read my exchanges with those people. And so it's, it's been great for me to kind of sharpen my arguments against some of those very stubborn parroting people because it, it helps me work on my arguments. So when I get to the show, I'm ready to kind of tell you, okay, you're going to hear your Facebook friends say X and here's what I think about it and here's my counter to it. And, and I think that has, that has kind of helped me. In terms of being radical, some people are going to see it that way. Some people are not going to like that you're posting about politics, period, and they're going to unfollow you. You, you just have to – there's a saying in weightlifting, everybody that pushes will get hurt. And so if you push, you're going to get hurt, and you don't know how or when or why or who, and it, it, it's not going to be that hurtful. It's going to suck that day, and it's going to kind of ruin your day that, like, this person said something mean to you. But over the grand – like if you look at kind of my life in doing this, I think I've affected a lot more people positively than I have pissed off people online, you know, and, and it's because I just try to be fair to people. If somebody is intentionally rude to me and mean to me uh, for the entertainment of my audience, I will treat them like a Christian in a Coliseum. <laughs> um, but by and large, I just try not to be like, I don't take the bait. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much of that helps you. I'm kind of rambling at this point. But to, to summarize, speak boldly because you have to. You don't have a choice. If you believe something passionately and you think people need to hear your message or our message, you need to talk about it because mm -hmm. that amplification will make a difference. Yeah. Uh, the, the children are now getting their bottles washed because – one person went to the media and said, I'm a lawyer. I've been inside. I need you to write an article about this. This is terrible. And then hundreds of thousands of people shared that material and it put pressure on the politicians to act. And so if you, if you watch the Vietnam War and realize how egregious policymaking is in war and how many of these politicians got 59,000 American men and millions of Vietnamese and Laotians and, and Cambodians killed because they wanted to get reelected. What kind of deranged behavior? John F. Kennedy literally says at one point, I, I, I know that we're never going to win this war and we probably shouldn't be in it, but I can't get out of it because I've got to look like I'm fighting the communists and I need to win re-election. He says that in 1962. It's a decade before we get out and millions are killed. That's, yeah. it, that is psychotic deranged behavior yeah and just because he sits in the oval office it doesn't change the fact that that is a psychotic notion that you're going to kill people so you can get reelected. now that may be seen as a radical statement but when you hear it you go yeah right on but there's going to be people who believe in the religion of militarism that go you just don't respect our troops and blah 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 it's like just don't even waste your time with that person Say what you believe because the people that go, yes, I, I agree, are far more than the people that are going to give you shit. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So just, you know, start out light. Like, yeah. I, I really agree with this article. Or can you believe this is happening? Or, and then, like, you know, once you get a little more comfortable – then really crank it up and start sharing, you know. Uh, one thing I try never to do is I, I never try to go after classes of people, maybe cops a little bit, but, you know, like 
I never try to go after soldiers or teachers or I, I will occasionally just to try and prove a point. Um, I will occasionally say cops and cops are uh, teachers are becoming worse than cops in terms of wanting and demanding respect from the from the citizenry. And, and it's to illustrate the point that just because you are a civil servant, it does not mean that we need to bow down and kiss your ass. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, if you demand respect from the taxpayers wrong, you should thank us for your pay, your paycheck. Like you, you're stealing from me to earn your money. And, and the idea that we have to respect all teachers and all police and all soldiers is really just a backhanded way for us to politely accept the fact that we're being robbed. Um, and so I will occasionally go after certain classes to make a, a particular point to protect taxpayers and to get to pe people to think a little bit more about certain things but like when you're being when you're talking about anti-war issues the dumbest thing you can do is go after soldiers you know like all soldiers are baby killers is about the least persuasive argument on the planet because mm -hmm. in reality if you've talked to soldiers most of these guys just wanted a better economic opportunity the gi bill or you know free college and then they get in and they realize like how fucked up everything is and then they vote Ron Paul. Like, so you, you, if you talk about broad swaths of people, um, you can get into a lot of trouble. Um, you know, so just try to avoid anything that feels too personal. Stick to ideas. You know, if you, if you get good enough at this and become a professional shit poster like myself, then think about it. But um, I kind of know where the boundaries are on this stuff because I've done it so long. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what are you going to post first? <laughs> is, there some, is there something you've wanted to post and you're like, ah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this. There's a lot of things that I want to post that I don't post. Oh. Like what? I can't, I don't know. I can't really think of anything off the top of my head, but I'm just kind of one of those people that like, I, I don't, I don't really like to offend people a lot of the time. Right. Like I, I've always been sort of like a, a kind of passive person and I don't like to stir things up, but I mean, like learning all this, I, I do feel, I, I do feel really charged up, but I don't know how I'm not used to putting my message out there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I, I'm just kind of not used to that. Mm? I don't know how to explain that very well, but no, I get it. It's uncomfortable. And, and when I started this show, it was like, who am I to tell people that I'm an authority on anything and to declare that I'm a political pundit? Like it was very odd to people that I had declared myself a political pundit. And I just pretended that I was until lo and behold, I've deluded people like your sweetheart into believing that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, like you just do it. And over time, it just, like people accept it, I guess. And so it's so like, what's the most radical thing? I say it out loud here in a safe audience. We're two hours and 12 minutes in. So like only the most hardcore people are listening. They're not going to judge you, but I think it'd be good if you say it out loud in a public forum. What's like the most radical thing you believe that you want to say, but you, you, you're too afraid to say. Probably that I think we should get rid of all welfare. Okay. Like everything. Oh my God, I got to get, I, get, I can't I, say this podcast. I'm just kidding. I know that's not, I know that's probably not radical to you, but like I have, I, a lot of people that I know support that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people I know. Uh, why? Why do they, uh, why do they support getting rid of welfare or they support welfare? Well, it's more of just the fact of like taking care of the poor. Like they feel like uh, we they feel like we have the responsibility to do that and i don't and okay. i just feel like a lot of people would argue that against me yes um like on july 4th for instance when i said um something to the, uh, to the effect of july 4th is about supporting our natural rights and not about supporting the cult of militarism you know because i basically think that our 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 american iconography has been hijacked to mean bombing people <laughs> 
So the, the flag now means killing foreigners as opposed to supporting natural rights. That's a very offensive thing to say on Facebook. But a lot of people messaged me and said, you know, I never thought of it that way. Abolishing welfare. I would not say, I, you know, like get on there and post abolish all welf welfare now. I would say, okay, so let me ask you, like, what are some ways to kind of persuade someone of that mindset that just believes, I, for instance, I'm a person who just believes that we should help the poor and we live in the richest country in the world. And so therefore we need welfare. What are some ways that you think you might persuade me to think otherwise? What do you think would persuade my mindset? What facts or figures or arguments have you seen that have persuaded you, for instance? Um, well, I, I've kind of just really always felt that way. Okay. Um, I just see it as like, there's people on the lines of poverty that are paying taxes towards that. Why, you know, who, who's helping them? Mm -hmm. Why are they, why are we all being forced to contribute to something like that? And, and something that a lot of people take advantage of anyway. Right. And something that deval that lessens the value in their own life to begin with because it takes away their incentive to reach for higher goals. And a lot of people who would argue against that, their perspective is, is well, how, where are they going to start? If they, if they grew up poor, how are they going to start? You know, how are they going to become successful if they don't have anything to start from right you know I mean? okay so and they have like they are operating off of a story a myth right so like it's 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 not a totally a myth that welfare helps people but they're operating under a, a, a cliche basically there's a great book by jonah goldberg called the tyranny of cliches and it takes every one of these cliches from the left and kind of demolishes them with facts and figures. And that, in my mind, is a great way to handle this. The best way libertarians often like to argue the immorality of government programs. Well, morality doesn't really count for much in 2019, does it? But the utilitarian argument, the usefulness, the re, you know, what's the results argument really does persuade a lot of people. So where I would start is say, okay, I'm against welfare. Well, what kinds of welfare are there? Like, what does welfare look like in the modern United States? Mm -hmm. What programs are there? What programs are working? What programs are not working? Um, you know, so I would always, if you're into a subject like, uh, let's say welfare, Google welfare think tank. <clears throat> See if there's a think tank that is working on welfare research. Um, you know, maybe some conservative think tanks like AEI or um, Stanford and, and the Hoover Institution are working on programs. And maybe they have a paper, a study or a report that you can download and, and read about statistics on welfare. Um, maybe there's a book that you can get from the library that talks about welfare from an anti-welfare perspective. And find that single source or, or several sources and read about it. And what you learn is, A, how does welfare work? Who is on welfare? How is it accessed? How is it ineffective? How is it inefficient? And here are the 15 reasons why it doesn't work. And then you're, you're going to understand the issue a lot better. And you now got facts and figures to kind of attach to your feelings and then find supporting articles or maybe even some of those resources and share that with your friends and say, you know, we believe X, but Y is true. And I didn't realize that 58% of dollars spent on welfare by the federal government are wasted. I made that figure up, but like start persuading people with those facts and figures that you've learned. And what you realize is once you've studied and you've like, I've, I've been studying for 20 years now. It's very hard to beat me in arguments on things like immigration because I've been arguing immigration for 20 years. You, you, these people who got interested in politics in 2016 because of Trump and they're 18 years old on Instagram, 
they're, they're fucked <laughs> because yeah. I have been arguing this for so long and they're arguing cliches. And what you realize is you start to like pick that stuff apart with facts and figures and they can't keep up. So they get mad and they, they leave. But for you to really persuade people, you need to be informed first. And so take that thing that you're kind of like, all right, this is a sincerely held belief. I need to understand the issue, research a little bit, and then start talking about it once you feel a little confident in what you're saying. Like, I think if you got on Facebook tonight and posted abolish all welfare, you'd feel very uncomfortable with that because you wouldn't have any defense. But you're going to feel, I can tell you with certainty, you're going to feel totally different when you feel you can defend yourself intellectually. Uh, you will absolute that feeling of, of anxiety will go away because you're going to know what you believe. Like, you know, I, I would also, I will frequently do this in the case of like welfare, for instance, I will go find left leaning think tanks and people that I know I'm going to disagree with. I'll read Vox all the time. Like if I'm researching a subject, I will always go read think progress Vox listen to democracy now i will always you know or ben shapiro when it comes to militaristic stuff i always want to know what the other side's arguments are because i may be wrong and and what you have to kind of learn is that the argument always kind of falls somewhere in the middle when it comes to facts and figures mm -hmm. so that's how i would approach it if i were you yeah yeah i, 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 I and i'm talking about five hours of work there maybe five maybe maybe two to three hours of reading maybe an hour total like to understand welfare for the rest of your life mm -hmm. it's, there it's, are really anti-welfare books huh oh yeah <laughs> uh ken eberstadt wrote a book um maybe it's nate eberstadt i know it's eberstadt e b maybe it's E B B E R S T A D T. Okay. And he wrote, he wrote a book basically about, it's a really small book too, about how basically the welfare state is killing us. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll remind me and I'll find the book and I'll, I'll tell you what the name of it is. Um, but yeah, like that's a hundred page book that you read that one book man, they're not going to be able to touch it and you'll probably be able to persuade like 20 people. You won't be able to persuade the comments, but you'll be able to persuade the readers. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to look into that. Mm. Yeah. Start with one subject that you're passionate about. Get your bearings. And then what I, I now have a whole system down. That's why I can do a show every week on something different. Like I have to take break weeks. Like I'll have, I'll be on vacation because I have to read a bunch of stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm constantly reading things uh, on politics from both a moral perspective, but also the utilitarian perspective. You know, what are, what are the philosophical principles, but what are also the policy results? And once mm -hmm. you kind of learn how to do that research, it's, it, it's not easy. It's dedication, but it, it's, it's not hard. It's, it's really fun like to, to go through and do this stuff. So mm -hmm. you'll start with welfare. You'll kind of go, oh, this is how you do research on this stuff. And then you can do welfare and then immigration and then Iraq and then the history of World War I. And, that, you know, and it helps having a research team, so, which I have. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what has been probably the most surprising aha moment that you might have had during this? Um, oh goodness. I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I, I haven't really had an aha moment. Um, except for the, you know, learning that, you know, the federal reserve is totally separate from the federal <laughs> government. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I didn't Most people that, done, but, yeah. Um, but I don't know. i I haven't really had like an aha moment. Um, it was not, I, I mean, I got a lot of perspective from you on certain issues that I'm, that I'm thinking differently of now. Um, Give me a couple examples. Well, the environmentalism, I mean, it makes sense. You, 
the government isn't really doing a good job anyway. So what's the difference between that and having private organizations running it? Right. Um, so, I mean, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It'll be more moral and more effective. What's the downside? <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, and if, if we did have a court system that, you know, wasn't screwed up, if we had one that worked the way it was supposed to, I feel like we would be able to take people to court more easily for the environmental damage that they do versus now when... Uh, I feel like you just, we kind of put that responsibility on the government and then they end, just, end up just doing a shitty job anyway. Right. So. But at least we all feel like something was done. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know, I... The show's been going on for like two hours now. I suppose we should probably. <laughs> yes, wrap that. it up. So give me your final thoughts. Anything else that you'd like to say to the audience? Um, well, I hope that there's some other newbies out there that listen to this and found something helpful from it. <laughs> I yeah. Hope. Uh, and hit me up if you're one of them. And Miranda, if you have more questions, if you have more thoughts, that I'd love to have you back on. This is great. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I, I'd probably be adding more on to the Facebook page or, or something like that later on, definitely. I, I really liked the response that I got last time. I, I got a bombardment of information, which is really nice and helpful. So everybody on there seems pretty helpful, and I appreciate that. Yeah, don't be shy. Like, you, if you have questions, ask. Like, that's the only way you're going to learn, and... You're not going to get screeched at. Our audience, our audience is pretty nice. Like, you know, Miranda, you got very helpful responses. And that's one thing that I pride myself about. I pride myself about Wall is that it has created an environment that is accepting and friendly of people that don't know everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I feel like that, that is what's going to turn more people onto it. Like, yeah. you know, like, like you mentioned, you can't just kind of like, shout your opinion and expect people to like come to your side like you're gonna have to be understanding and and see things from their side too all right great well with that we're gonna end it and miranda thank you so much for taking the time yeah thank you so much for having me on absolutely and thank you to everybody that's listening and if you've got questions join that facebook group uh, or a discord if you're not a facebook person or just tweet at us or email us or whatever and uh, we'll, be, we'll be happy to get back to you as soon as we can. Um, thank you to Miranda for joining me. Thank you to all the patrons, and we will see you in a couple of weeks.